case, we will call the meeting to order. Um, the first item is public invited to be heard. And I don't see anyone here, but want to check um, if we have anyone, Erica? No, we don't have anybody. Okay. Um, the next item is approving the minutes from our January 13th meeting. We have a motion to approve those. Okay. Robert, you're on mute. Uh, need a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Okay, do we have a second? I second. Okay, thanks, Karen. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the January 13th, 2022 meeting, please raise your hand. Okay, all opposed? And abstentions, Deanna, okay. That passes, fantastic. Next item is finalizing the 2022 work plan. Well, first of all, I wanna apologize for not adding it to the packet. Karen comes to my office and we send it. I'm like, I think we forgot. So, but I do have it and I will share it. <coughs> Let me share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see the work plan? Yes. Yeah, I think we should add a party for Karen somewhere here. <laughs> that should be on our work plan. It should. <laughs> Celebrating Karen. Uh, but here are the current um, work plan items, um, you know, I, I do want to say, um, you know, we, we, the board has made it, um, asked that we, we move up our, our funding process, our uh, sending it out. Um, I think the only caveat, I think I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, is because we're doing it in collaboration, you know, we, of course we will try, but there may be some outside, you know, with our partners as, as we transition from our current, grant management system to the next. So just want to want to let the board know that we will we will try our hardest to move it up and uh, there may be some issues as we transition. So just want to give the board a heads up about that. But yes, we are still hoping to get it out sooner than it is here. That's not it's, sure if it happened. When you say we're transitioning, does that just mean transitioning to the new year in the system or we're changing systems altogether? New software. We're, okay. I took it away from the, I was going to review it, but we have a lot to talk about. So, but uh, we are getting a new software. Uh, it's called Foundant. Um, and um, that that is going to be a different, um, that we are in the works to finish all of that. Um, so we're hoping that that'll happen soon uh, to give us ample time to transition the application process. Um, so yeah, that's that's what, what we're doing. Hmm. Cool. Thanks for the update on that. So this is our the rest of the the work plan. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions, things they want to add. Um, I think we added the training. I did not. I will make sure we do. No, we talked about it. Are there any questions about the work plan or things that we need to include that folks don't? So, so Ellie, so so sorry. So Eliberto, um, was the training the in July? Was it for the scoring, how to score and evaluate the applications? Right, yeah. Yeah, it is there in July. Yes, it's the first item on in July. 
And, and I just realized, Karen, did we introduce Molly? Well, I was so going to... I was going to wait for questions and then do it. <laughs> yeah, I think after this, after we did the work plan, we were going to, and then I need to introduce myself to the two new members since I was um, absent last month also. Okay. But right. I figured we'd get through the work plan discussion and then introduce Molly and, and then Molly can end and I will stay on and I can also introduce myself. All right. Okay. So, with that, any any other items that need to be added or considered for the work plan for 2022? Okay. It doesn't look like it right now. Hit it out of the park on the first go, Eliberto. So, um, do we need to have a motion to approve the work plan for, for the year? It probably would be good. Okay. Do we have Deanna? Okay, and we need a second. Okay, Stacy is seconding. All right, all those in favor of adopting the work plan as proposed, please raise your hand. Okay, that's everybody. <clears throat> all right. Yes, Karen. So I would, um, I, I would like to introduce Molly O'Donnell. Uh, Molly is our new Housing and Community Investment Division Director. She has um, taken over that role for Kathy Fedler, who retired on January 28th of this year. And so, um, so Molly, so I would just um, have Molly introduce herself, tell us anything that she wants to um, about, uh, about herself. So Molly, uh, take it away. Sure. Uh, so the first and most obvious thing about myself is you might hear toddlers in the background because um, no matter how much soundproofing, it's never enough. But um, I am Molly O'Donnell. I've been working with Kathy hand in hand on our CDBG disaster recovery program for the flood work since 2016. Um, and before that, I was really in, you know, all things, different types of federal funding for about 16 years now total. So um, federal funding is really my, you know, my specialty. And um, I'm excited to take over leadership of the division. Um, it includes working with our housing and community investment team, which we are really, really working hard to staff up right now. We need, we have a lot of resources coming and need a lot of capacity. And also with our Longmont Housing Authority arm. Um, so I'm excited to meet you all and you'll be hearing from me here on the work plan come next month, March, to talk about our first 2022 funding round. Um, on that subject, I will let you know, we did open up a fourth quarter funding round right before Molly McElroy left the city. And we only got one application that was quite small for a business related activity. So we're just gonna combine that um, and have that application considered with anything else we get in this spring funding round. So if you were wondering what happened with that, that was the, that was the status there. So I will see you in March. Awesome. Welcome, Molly. To Thanks, your Molly. <laughs> All right. I'm going to leave you to the rest of the agenda and go parent. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Molly. Thanks. You know, and then just to, to let you know is that uh, you you might see Kathy Fedler back again. She is um, she's having a well-deserved vacation right now. And when she gets back toward the end of this month, uh, we are, um, she's going to come back on as a, a temporary staff, part-time staff member for the city. As, um, as Molly indicated, we did have, um, we've had a, a couple of staff resignations in housing and community investment. We've done some reorganizing. There is, um, you know, one position we do need to fill, which is someone to operate the inclusionary housing program. Um, we, um, 
it's hard to hire people these days. So we, um, we've offered the position twice to um, successful candidates and twice um, it, it, we were rejected. So uh, for, uh, you know, for different reasons, but um, so we still are in the process of interviewing for that. And that's really a role that Kathy's gonna come back and, um, and, and play because she really is the one that, well, we don't have an inclusionary housing program. <laughs> if, she's, if she's really not here to, to run that given everything that's on Molly's plate. So, so anyhow, you, you may be seeing Kathy back again at, um, at, at some point. We hope that that's a, a short term, maybe uh, three, four months at the, at, at the most so that we do get someone on board and that there'll be the opportunity for Kathy to train the, um, the new person that's gonna be running inclusionary housing, so. So just FYI, and I do want to introduce myself to Stacy and to Robert. Um, so I'm Karen Roney. I'm the community services director for um, for the the city until I retire, which is the end of March. Um, and uh, so anyhow, so I, I apologize. I had um, um, I had a death of the family and um, headed back to Illinois and had to miss our first meeting. So um, so. There you go. And I've been with the city for, um, I'm in my 32nd year. And, um, and so, um, so yes, so I am, um, I'm also going to be um, retiring at, uh, at the end of March. So. And do they have a replacement yet for you, Karen, or someone no, like that? Or? Not, not yet. You know, we're, we're working on, you know, sometimes when when you've worked somewhere for like a long time, like I have, you know, you just kind of acquire duties and responsibilities and, um, you know, you just step up and do what needs to be done. And, and then, you know, when you go to look at, all right, who, who, who would run a, a department that has golf um, and affordable housing and libraries and, you know, all the recreation. So, so, um, so we're taking a look at the, um, you know, what would be, um, what would be the kind of the the right mix of responsibilities for for someone coming into this role, and so we're we're taking some time with that. I would imagine that we we will probably have some kind of an interim, um, you know, role for the for the next few months um, while you know why we figure that out and it, it really is the city manager's opportunity to you know when you have a um, department head that leaves to really take a peek at what uh, what might be a, a different way of organizing things that's a, a little easier to do when you have um, when someone has left the left the position so got it yeah um, I think that that was your your long way of saying that you're irreplaceable, and so uh, now now they have to figure out how uh, how maybe multiple people uh, fill the shoes of Karen. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just not the yeah, it's it like I said, you just do things as you as you're with the organization and you develop skills and you know you're willing to step up. So yeah, but that that's not the the long term the long-term solution so understood i am totally replaceable so, <laughs> so. never never mm -hmm. but <laughs> but it's nice to meet you stacy and robert and i i am sorry that i missed the opportunity to meet you last month same here karen thank you all right um anything else before we go on to the next item on the agenda Did... okay so we've got the proposal for allocating the remaining 2022 human services funds. I'm not sure. Keep if, going, Alberto. I, I like, I, I, you know, I, I'm retiring. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, uh, last year, toward the end of the year, I think it was in our December 9th meeting, we talked about um, how we had $100,575 uh, that were unallocated from the human services funding um, grant application process. Um, and we, we, we talked about different priorities. And at the end, we said, you know, 
we talked about the LDARE program and that that would be our top priority. And then, um, but we, we were waiting to see, I think the big question was how much um, uh, the county had applied for um, another state grant um, to help cover it. And we were waiting to see how much that grant would be to see how much we needed to uh, allocate to that. Well, we have found out the numbers um, and the, the, the state grant came in at $81,000, which is 40% of what we asked, um, uh, which I'm hearing is pretty typical. Um, and so when we, when we redid budgets with the LDARE team, we realized that we need basically all of the funding to cover the cost to ensure that it can go through the end of this year. Um, because we, we didn't get as much as we expected or, or uh, desired to get from uh, the, the state grant. So at this point, that's, that's where we are. So because we're, we're looking at um, $181,000 between us and the counties through the state fund. So, so, I, think, um, so I think what we just wanted to do is to affirm uh, you know, that was the number one priority of the um, advisory board as we, um, as in December when we had a discussion about this. So, um, so in, in essence, you know, what we'd be saying is that um, we can, you know, pretty much um, take that total amount that we had unallocated uh, to, to fully uh, fund the, the Longmont outreach team through the end of, of 2022. Just wanted to confirm that um, you are good with your direction that you gave us. <clears throat> um, Ellie Berto or Karen, um, for the sake of the new folks um, here, could you give a quick rundown of what L there is and what they do? Um, so sure. They have a sense of, you know, why, and then we can talk about sort of why we had made that direction, but I think if you get a review that that may help. Yeah, and, and of course I always, uh, we presented to the city council on Tuesday about the neighborhood impact team and LDARE is a big partner, but let me talk a little bit about LDARE. So it's the Longmont targeted um, engagement um, and referral effort. Uh, so that's the L, what LDARE stands for. It's a three person team. Um, and I'll get to what they do in a second, but let me just talk about the team. I think, I think it makes them unique, and I think it makes them, um, in my mind, a very um, innovative program. It's made up of three people, um, three positions. One of the positions is a person with lived experience. In other words, they have been homeless in the past. One of the positions is a mental health uh, person, mental health um, subject matter expert. And then the last one is a, basically a, someone who has had experience working on homelessness services, so case management, et cetera. And it's made up of these three people. Um, and what they do is they really uh, are, are on the street five days a week. In the past, Longmont hadn't had full-time outreach um, you know, the, the hope does outreach, but they do it in little. They don't. They don't. They don't do it every day or every every or five days a week. Um, so these folks are out there five days a week, um, four hours a day, and they connect with unhoused uh, folks to try and encourage them, motivate them, work with them, build relationships, so that they can access services. Our our coordinated and free short services through homeless solutions from Boulder County. Um, they've had over 400 contacts in the year. I, I get their, their what they, it's called the caper. It's a, um, it, it's a, it's a, a, a state mandated report. They sent it to me. I was saying to the county, the county sent it to me and they've had over 400 contacts since they started. We are working on the next week, we're gonna work on even more data uh, analysis to, to, cause the council had some questions. But fundamentally, they are a, a really great uh, program that is connecting not only with people experiencing homelessness, but with other other outreach providers um, they, and, and really coordinating along with hope 
a lot of the efforts that are being made in Longmont to help folks move for housing. Um, so that that's what they do, and I think they're that it, it's been a, it, a great first year, and looking forward to see how it continues to develop throughout this year. Uh, Karen, you want to add anything else? No, I I think that is um, you know that that's good. I mean, I think what you know what we had been um, advocating for 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 several years, Eliberto and I is. Um, is really to have a more robust outreach uh, focus in our homeless solutions for Boulder County. You know, not everyone just, you know, walks up to, you know, to the entry to the coordinated entry door and says, you know, I'm ready to, I'm, I'm ready for services. I'm, I'm ready to, um, you know, I'm ready to do something differently than um, live my life um, on, on the street. And so um, it really was uh, an important component that we felt um, we needed to try to fill, you know, really in order to, to determine, you know, how effective outreach is and really working with people on the street and continuing to build that relationship as Eliberto talked about to, um, to, to hopefully be there when, um, when maybe someone is, is really ready to, to take a different step and to go down a different path. And um, so, so it gives us an opportunity to really evaluate, you know, after this, the end of this two year period about, you know, how, how effective is this outreach function in our effort, effort to address homelessness and to help people who are unhoused to get housing. Um, and, you know, and, and as Eliberto mentioned, we, we presented, um, it's a broader concept, and I think maybe it'd be good to, to send the email to um, or the PowerPoint to the members of the advisory board. I mean, it was a broader initiative. It was called the the Neighborhood Impact Team, um, and it's 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 a it's an approach that we are are piloting here at the at the city that better coordinates some of our collaboration efforts across the organization. Uh, to deal with um, kind of challenging and gnarly issues in, in the community. And so the first issue was um, was uh, the Lanyon Park area, which I'm sure you have read about if you've been following with on the paper and and the, um, the that had, had become a place where people who are unhoused um, or maybe aren't stably housed uh, started to congregate, um, you know, the end of last year. and um, and really created some challenges uh, for, um, for folks who use the park, for people living in the surrounding neighborhood. And so, so that particular team, um, you know, organized to really try to address that issue in, in the park. And, um, and L there has been a, a, a very strong partner in, in that effort. So, so we'll send you that PowerPoint and I think that will be, um, um, helpful in, in terms of what we are, you know, what we're trying to accomplish and, and what is L there's um, responsibility. So anyhow, the, um, so one of the council members mentioned during that meeting was uh, that meeting on Tuesday is that, you know, if indeed we, we do determine that the, um, that this outreach effort is an important cog in the, in the um, system of working with people experiencing homelessness, that you know, maybe that is something that we, I don't know, the royal we, but that this board, or when it comes time for the next round of uh, funding for uh, human services, that you know, maybe that's a, a service we want to think about, um, you know, funding on a on an ongoing basis. So, so we just want to make sure because we're about to spend all the rest of the money. So, <laughs> so it would be great to get a motion to confirm that that is indeed what you would support us doing with those unallocated dollars. And I think for Stacy and Robert, we had unallocated dollars and maybe Caitlin, you were gonna talk about this, but um, we we ended up, the, um, the council ended up increasing the amount of funds set aside for human service agency grants um, by a larger amount than what we thought um, we did ask for, and we were shooting for 
um, 3% of the general fund dollars to be set aside for uh, human services and the grants that you all helped to manage. Uh, last year or in 2021, that uh, set aside amount was 2.52%. We did, um, you know, we did request to go up to 2.75% in 2022. And heck, council said, let's just go for the gold. You said you wanted 3%. We have, um, we're gonna go ahead and just bump it up to 3% and, um, and you, just, you just go. So yeah, <laughs> so, but it ended up the way we had, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this later on in the agenda, but the, um, the way we had our process set up and um, how we scored applications, we ended up not allocating all the dollars. And, uh, and so we talked about, you know, options uh, for allocating the remaining dollars. And, and this that we just talked about was providing gap funding for the LDARE project, because we really only have that for one time, that that, that made sense to invest it in that effort. Yep. And, and I would add, you know, one of one of the things we talked about and this is a reminder this is a reminder for myself and for the rest of us that you know our top priority and the thing that we saw in the needs assessment and that we heard from so many of our partners was that addressing you know housing affordability um and the availability of housing and sort of everything that revolves around that what is the high is the highest priority in our community and we don't necessarily have nonprofits and agencies um, that are, we have some, but we don't have as many dedicated to that as we would like. And so, you know, the LDARE program is sort of an innovative new program that is not um, sort of built into the processes yet. Um, and so we felt like taking that additional funding and putting it towards something that was really addressing that underlying need, um, you know, getting creative a little bit with it and not necessarily saying, oh, it has to go to an agency, you know, a nonprofit in the community, but actually saying like, let's address what that top priority need was, was one of the things that we were prioritizing. Um, does that, uh, if anyone else remembers differently about that conversation um, and sort of what we were thinking there, that's my recollection is that, you know, we saw that we had not fully funded what we wanted to for housing stability and affordability. And so this was an opportunity to, to put that money toward that. Looks, looks like Karen Phillips is reading the article. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, I read it this morning. I was, I was just trying to see how Hope and this uh, L, L there. Mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. Hopefully they kind of work hand in hand. So I, I, I can talk to that, Karen, I can talk to that. So, so a, a couple of layers I want to talk about that. Um, so first and foremost, um, in Longmont, it's proper. Uh, Andy, who is Hope's um, outreach director, and L there meet on a weekly basis. They uh, they case conference difficult situations very regularly. And then on a, on a on the next broader level, we are you know the city of Longmont and Hope L there um, recovery cafe and are part of a uh, HSBC or Homeless Solutions Boulder County working group where we um, we meet with um, all the different agencies doing outreach throughout the county and, and in particular in Boulder. Uh, and and um, I will say we had a meeting today and I felt really proud at that meeting because a lot of the other agencies were talking about how well coordinated and collaborative we work here in, in Longmont. Um, so Hope and L there are a big part of that. Um, and of course, so is, so is uh, our, our, our public safety with Officer Kennedy and Officer Arnie. Uh, but we, yeah, we, there, there was a lot of talk about how well coordinated Longmont is and, and I'm proud that, that we we're a part of that. So that's how they work together. Thanks. That's great, Eliberto. Um, are there other questions or comments about um, allocating those additional funds from our last funding round to LDARE?
And if there are not, do we have a motion to confirm that that's the direction we want to go with those um, un currently unallocated funds? A motion to allocate the unallocated funds to the elder program for 2022. Okay. Do we have a second? Okay. Looks like Robert is going to second that. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All right. That is unanimous. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. The next item is. 2023, starting the discussion for 2023 human services funding. And I am guessing, Eliberto, that is you again. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling up the, the, the PowerPoint. <laughs> All right. Eliberto's got like five PowerPoints ready for us tonight. <laughs> I usually do. So take a point. Uh, so and it's not really initiating. It's actually, I, I, it, it's part two. We actually, I, I was thinking about this. We actually started this on December 9th. And so there's going to be a little bit of recap for our, our new board members. And then we're going to get into the meat of the conversation. And like I told Karen, I don't think we're expecting resolution tonight. What we're expecting is, to, is, is the, the, the start of a conversation an idea flowing um, and and we will, we do have to get to a resolution, but I, I'm not expecting it tonight. I'm just expecting uh, that we start this conversation. Before we get, I'm gonna kind of- Well, and, and you know what I would add to that, Elibert, is that it, start the conversation and you know, if, if there is, because the ideas we'll talk about are really initial um, concepts. And so if there's some direction from the advisory board around, you know, hey, we don't, we don't think either of these concepts are what we want to pursue or yes, let's go and dig a little more into one of these and you all might come up with some other ones. So, so we, I think we do want some kind of direction in terms of we would like to know more about how this process could work. So, um, so it's start the discussion, but have some initial direction would be helpful. Right. Thank you. All right, so um, just to, if I can get this to work, um, just to review, uh, I think we talked a little bit about it, um, or Karen talked a little bit about it. You know, we have been really advocating for the council to bump us up to 3%. It, it, it's taken some time, but, um, you know, we're, we, we, received, we reached that goal, which is great. And really what that means is that at this point, unless there's an economic downturn, our set aside will continue to grow. I mean, it was growing when it was at 2.7 and 2.5, it's gonna to continue to grow uh, even more. So um, unless, like I said, unless there's an economic down, downturn, we are, we are on a positive, um, positive bent at this point. So we think it's time to review the process. And let me just, for those that have not gone through the process, let me just review the process. And those and, and the rest of us know this. So basically, we have an application that we uh, that the that we put out in um, with our partners, the city of Boulder and Boulder County, every year. Uh, it's been going through EC Impact. This year it'll be to through Foundit. And the way that we assign points uh, to the to the application, or you can break it down into making sure that the programs are addressing one of our priority areas. And I haven't listed them here, but I, I will in the next slide, um, that, that, they're this, that they are actually um, delivering a program that meets a need and is demonstrating that they have an impact on the community through their evaluation process or uh, how they track um, and then demonstrating sound financial management and operational practices. And that also includes that you know the the board in their evaluation gets to evaluate how they're addressing equity through their work. Uh, the staff gets to evaluate how they're addressing equity and diversity through their through their staff and board members. Um, and so once everyone reviews and scores, we take averages of the staff score and the board score, and we 
we total the, the, the scores to determine the percentage of requests to be funded. And, then, and this is arbitrary to, in the point that the board, I, I present the board with options of ranges of percentages and scores. This year, uh, this past year, it was 74 and below would not be recommended for funding, but that can change. You know, the board can change that. We've had it higher, we've had it lower. Um, it, it just really depends uh, on what, what model the board wants to move forward with. So currently that's how we decide funding. There is no upfront conversation with agencies about how much they can apply for. Um, you know, it, it's basically, it's apply for what you want. And then depending on what score you receive, um, what priority you're in, that will determine uh, how much funding, how much percentage of, the, of your request is funded. All right. Um, if there's any questions, you can stop me whenever if, if you need more explanation. But part of the current, so what part of the process is in the past, Longmont used to actually take historical funding in um, in account, right? And we, the board, decided a few years ago that we were going to reset every year to zero. We're not going to take historical funding into account. Um, we're going to create pipe ceilings for priorities, and what that means is we're try we're going to try not to spend more than a certain percentage of the entire uh, set aside on each priority. I will say that in, in practice, that has not happened. We tend to usually spend more on things like education and skill building primarily because there's many more nonprofits asking for funding there um, than there are in others. Um, and of course we usually What's interesting is we usually spend very little, well, not very little, but we never ever hit our target in housing stability um, of 25%. We, we rarely get there. I think we usually get to 17% of funding goes there. Um, Self-sufficiency, 20% is pretty pretty on par. We, we do get that. And then, so we had those priority ceilings for the priorities, and then we decided, okay, so we want to have an individual agency ceiling and we said no agency could receive more than 50% of the total priority ceiling. So depending on which priority you are, you may get you, your 50% is higher. So if you're in housing, you have a higher individual ceiling than if you're in safety and justice. Um, so that is um, part of the, of the, the thing, part of the process. Any questions before I go on? That's the that's the recap. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens. I can't see everybody, so. All right. I don't see any hands raised or anything right now, okay. Eliberto. So here are the unintended realities of our current process and formula. So we have a hard time funding the highest priority area. And again, I, I talked about number of agencies applying to their priority area uh, is, is low, uh, like Caitlin mentioned earlier. Um, agencies not knowing how much they can receive. We don't really announce that we reset to zero, and, but so agencies and development directors, I know I've done this work before. It's just so easy to copy and paste what you've done in the past. And so we get a lot of that happening, including the amounts that they're asking for. Um, so, we, we rarely meet our priority goals uh, when it comes to our priority areas. And even though we do have priority ceilings, we tend to get some great disparities in the amount of funding for which agencies apply. So some agencies apply for a whole lot and some agencies apply for very little. So that is a challenge too. I mean, um, you know, if, for example, if a new and unproven agency comes aboard and says, we're going to ask for 50,000, you know, if they score high enough, they might get that 50,000, even though they're pretty new compared to somebody who's been established um, and been around for a while and, and, and have, has developed, um, you know, um, really a, a successful model. Uh, but they're sticking to their traditional historical funding, right? And also, you know, if you go big, you 
get big, right? That's that's basically how it works uh, with our current model is the bigger you go, the bigger you get. And so that is also um, an unintended reality of how we, we currently fund. Um, because even if you, even if you, even if you only score for enough for 50%, if you ask for a lot, you're going to get 50% of a lot. Um, so that, that's part of the challenge too. All right. Any questions about that? Because now we're going to jump into concepts. I kind of, that's the, that's the, that's the base. I don't see any hands up. Oh, there's Brian's hand. Brian. Yes, Brian. Uh, just one thought on this, the disparity of what people are asking for, particularly along the lines of, you know, uh, say an organization is trying to game the model by asking for more than they really need. Um, presumably in their application, their need would have to be demonstrated. And I, I think this is one of the things in the interviews that we can do better is really push on how these needs are determined, you know, the demand and uh, understanding whether in fact organizations are just in artificially inflating their numbers or whether they are um, you know, speaking to the need that they're experiencing. Um, Brian, one thing I think that, uh, that comes to mind for me is that it, it ends up being less that organizations are asking for more that they need, than they need, then we see like some organizations that are doing incredible, like we also see the flip side of that, of like, we see some organizations that are doing really great work and are actually asking for relatively small amounts compared to like their overall budget. And they score well, they do well every time. And, you know, I don't know whether it's, they don't have the capacity to take more and do more which very well might be true, but also like, you know, we're sort of like, we're not helping anybody <laughs> by, by not sharing some of the, the information because it's really like people throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what, what sticks. And some people, are, some organizations are much more risk averse. Uh, you know, they don't want to count on getting a bunch of money if they're not going to get it. Um, and so they just ask for the same thing over and over, even though like we would probably fund them for more because they're doing such a good job at what they're doing. And, you know, it meets our priority areas, but they don't know enough of that information either from like our prior interviews or the application process to actually, you know, make an educated um, request. All right, Eliberto, I might have also just stolen a little bit of your thunder there, but. Uh... You, you, yeah, I think, I think that's exactly, well, and that's what these <laughs> concepts are gonna show. All right, so I have two concepts right now and I, um, that I wanna go over again, um, like to Karen's point, the board may say, no, we don't like these um, or we wanna learn more about them. All right, so here we go. So concept one is, do we create, we always had a, a ceiling, but maybe we need to think about creating a floor. And here is, I created a table. It's completely arbitrary. Uh, I just wanted to throw some numbers on there. Um, uh, you know, we can, we, can, we can change this around, but what I thought about was what if we, in our grant instructions, we talk about, you know, saying here are the, the floors and ceilings. And what I mean by floor is it doesn't mean that's what they're going to get, but it's the lowest amount they can apply for in that priority area. Um, and so those are, those are the numbers that I, again, arbitrarily put in. We can totally change them, uh, but I want to to at least show you a, a, a model of creating a floor and ceiling approach. And, and Alberto, I think you probably wanna, you know, cause we keep talking about ceiling. So we had a ceiling per area, but right. really not 
per application other than an agency couldn't get any more than 50% of the total amount that we were setting aside, if you will, for that priority area. So, so this would change. So the, the ceiling would be, you can't ask for any more than X. This is the maximum you can ask for, and this is the minimum that you can ask for. Right. And then and our, because, mm -hmm, oh, go ahead. Right. I mean, that's because our priority, our, our ceiling, and so on that Collins F22 ceiling, that was all back end stuff. That's stuff that I did when I when I did so. So so agency had, had no idea that there was this ceiling. In this model, we would we would put this up front. We would say this is the ceiling and this is the floor. Um, so they would know that going in, and they would they would reflect that in their application. And Eliberto, would this particular thing be for, uh, so we have distinguished in the past, right, an agency can actually apply for more than one program that they're doing. Um, I, I assume that it's open for discussion of whether this would be a per program or a per agency um, limitation. Great question. I didn't, even, I didn't even think about that. I. I, I, I think it would be per program in my mind, maybe Karen has a different thought, but in my mind it'd be pro, per program because really each program is an individual application. Right. Okay. Uh, Brian, I see your electronic hand raised. Caitlin. So the, the feeling is based on, it has always been based on allocation, not application request. But in this case, the floor is you have to ask for at least this much and you can't ask for more than this. Is that right? Or you can't be awarded more than this or less than that. So it's not about awards. It's about ask. Okay. You can't, you can't ask. So, for example, if you're in housing stability, you, can, you can't ask for more than 100000 and you can't ask for less than 60000 Again, arbitrary numbers, Brian. Um, okay. I got it. Now you may get depending on your score. What we're not doing tonight is we're not talking about an allocation formula and uh, allocation, you know, ranges. Uh, so potentially, depending on how we formulate that that allocation process, you may get less than the floor, but you can't ask for less than of it. Galaberto. You broke up a little bit there, Brian. I want to make sure we, we heard what you just said. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was just thanking Ellie Berto. Okay. Got it. Uh, Stacy. I have a question about, so I, I think this is a good idea. And I think that, um, that it, it's a, it's a better way of metering the amount that, that we have to give out. Um, I guess my question is, is, are there any organizations, say, specifically in the housing stability where um, I'm, I'm just, I'm only just guessing that the requests are larger there. Are there any organizations that have for, you know, more than one or two or three years been getting a larger amount than 100,000 that we would have to reach out to them that, that by limiting them to 100,000, it might, um, and, and again, you know, no promises that they were going to get this at all. But if they're kind of budgeting for that every year in their operations, is this something that could potentially negatively impact them? There's no, I, I, there's, it wouldn't affect anybody in the housing. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Safe no. shelter. But they maybe. get 100,000. But, but I would say to, to Stacy's point, depending on what that ceiling is, right? you know, that could be one agency, you know, because they get, I they get about a hundred thousand, um, but if we if we set that ceiling lower, you know, so there would be some entities, not not a lot, but there would be some agencies that could, um, you know, would know up front they're going to get less money. I mean, the flip side of that that I would add is that you know, there's some incentive then um, for some of these larger requests to break it into different programs. Um, sometimes they do like 
just a very generic uh, thing. Um, I will say that there are others that do have multiple programs they apply for and they apply for them separately. Um, you know, but encouraging, I mean, when you've got that big of a dollar amount, <laughs> encouraging it to break it down into some of the specific programs can help us get a little more detailed in terms of what they're what the issue is that they're addressing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if, if you know, just say hypothetically, Safe Shelter is one of the largest recipients and they've been receiving around 100,000, then that wouldn't be a big deal. I, I, I didn't know if there were agencies repeatedly receiving 200,000. Okay. If all of a sudden they came in at 100, that would be, you know, could be detrimental to their. Well, and, and this year, because there's four, they only received 90,000. Mm -hmm. I, I need to go, I, I'm pretty sure. So then it should be fine. Yeah, I would say it really starts hitting at this level, probably more your self-sufficiency folks. So for example, the R Center got 100,000 this year. Uh, that being said, this is the most they've ever gotten for any single program. Um, and education would be hit. If these, if these were the numbers as they are, these may not stay that way, but if, they, if it was as they are, the really the only two places that would get hit would be uh, self-sufficiency and education and skill building. I think the rest would be okay. Um, and there are other ways to, you know, manage around that too, to meet with them in advance and say, here's what's happened, you know, just so they're not surprised. Right. I think, so what I would, what I would say that as I think about this model, I think the only thing, or not the only thing, there's many things to consider, but an important thing to consider is we may run out of money fast, right? We will not have the same issue that we had this year if we start putting in a floor. Uh, so for example, EFA, I, I've used them before. They have a great housing program here in Longmont, and yet they only ask for 16,000 every year. Yeah. So. Um. I was, oh, uh, Deanna. So on the flip side of that, I guess I'm wondering if these floors are maybe going to discourage some organizations who might be asking for less money from applying, because if I were doing something new in the area of say housing stability and I was trying to get some funding for some novel program, um, I'm not sure I could justify a $60,000 request. I might not even bother applying. So I, I don't know if there are I can't remember what the asks have been historically in all of these categories, but I know we give out considerably less than some of these floors. So I'm just wondering if we're gonna discourage some people from applying. That's a potential, yeah, I, I think so. So then it's really how low do you wanna go in the floor? So, I mean, again, these are um, just illustrated, you know, for illustrated purposes, but yeah, certainly something to consider. If, if we want to move forward with this kind of a strategy. Okay. Other, um, Eliberto, um, just confirming, we're, th this is just ideas for us to start thinking about. We're not, we're not making any decisions tonight. Right. Uh, I suspect that, you know, when you, I think you said you had another concept that there will be more things that we want to talk about or consider. Um, Correct. Okay. If we're ready to move on, I, I can put up the next concept. Any other questions or comments on this concept? Um, Karen. I just like that the transparency of it, that that's kind of what I like about it. So anyway, good job. All right, I think we are ready to go on to the next one, Eliberto. So the next one is something we've seen before um, and I, I talked about it on the ninth. I just, I did it. I adopted it a little bit more to be, theirs is a little more restrictive. They, they just have like two cutoffs. But so what United Way does is they create ceilings based and floors on the budget size of the organization. It's not about the program. It's not about the ask. It's about your budget. So I, um, I again, like to Karen's point, this is just illustrative. These numbers are completely arbitrary, but I, I, I put them together so you can see. So we could just say, okay, we're going to go based on budget size. And this to, to, to Deanna's point, you know, if you got a smaller new agency, well, you still have an opportunity, right? So 
basically starting from the top, if, if you're an agency that has over a million dollar budget, then your ceiling is 100,000 and your floor is, is 75 and it goes down from there. Um, and then this would avoid our price. It, it does affect, I mean, it, it, it does, it does put into question how we value our priorities because now the allocations are no longer based on priorities, but based on budgets. Uh, but it does make it a little clearer for folks. Okay, so if my overall budget is 500,000, uh, I'm gonna apply for, for 75, between 75 and 50. And they can apply anywhere between there, right? For program. Uh, but this is another concept. <clears throat> It strikes me concept two is very inflexible and uh, concept one allows some leeway and some uh, a way of adjusting things. And this one is so formulaic that uh, it's almost inhuman in a way, <laughs> you know, rather than dealing, that's all my view is that I thought concept two was easy to conceive. And I think this one is a little bit too mechanical. <laughs> Other um, other folks have, uh, Brian, thanks for raising the hand. Okay. Um, so I am wondering, do we have a clear kind of idea of what, I'm, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna say what outcomes we're trying to achieve with these changes? Are we looking for greater transparency? Are we looking for, what we feel is more efficient utilization of the money. Um, that might be helpful for me as I look through these options and understand how they serve that purpose. So I have an answer, if Karen has an answer. Go ahead. <laughs> In my mind, it, it's a couple of things. I, I, and I think I mentioned them already. One is, you know, especially, especially with, with with concept one is how do we strengthen or encourage, or you know how how do we motivate folks to really think about our our number one priority and priorities in general, and then two is how do we we I would love to start um, closing the the disparate gaps we have between some of our large you know some folks I mean I, there's I think. I forget this year, but I know there's one one grant that we're doing for twenty five hundred dollars. That's a lot of work in 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 scoping the project and doing the contracting for twenty five hundred dollars. So try in my mind closing that gap, Brian, would be very I think an efficient and effective use of our dollars. Uh, so yeah, I, Karen, I'm not sure what your thoughts are. Yeah, so we tried to define that at the beginning of the slide deck, uh, Brian. So it, it is, in my mind, it's it's twofold. So it is Caitlin's metaphor of spaghetti on the wall. So, uh, so to move away from, I have no idea how much to ask for. I'm just going to throw spaghetti on the wall and, and see what sticks. So I, um, so I think we want to move away from that because of what, you know, what we out outlined in terms of some disparities. And I think it also helps us to be more um, proactive or, or more assuring more that where we say that, that if indeed housing stability is our most um, important need to address on a needs assessment, then how do we make sure that you know the applications that are coming in are that those dollars that we're gonna we're gonna get an adequate ask for that high stability area. So, or excuse me, that high priority area. So it deals with the spaghetti on the wall. I think it it uh, addresses the transparency that uh, Karen talked about, and I think the if different advisory board members have talked about that. You know, anyhow. So it's it's. Um, it's Mr. Wizard behind the curtain in terms of you know how we how we come up with our I mean we we know what we're doing I mean we know we have the formula and whatever else but um, but we can make it a little more transparent so I think those are two things that we try to outline those in the in the beginning that that's the problem if you will that we're trying to solve 
I think um, one thing too, like one thing I actually really like about concept two is that it also helps organizations to see like where they pay, like what's reasonable for their organization. You know, an organization that has a budget of under two hundred and fifty thousand, if they know off the bat that like the likelihood that we're going to fund something that's more than ten percent of their budget, like that having sort of that upper limit of like you know, don't come in and ask us to support 50% of your budget. That's a pretty big risk for us. Whereas, you know, sort of having a like 10% limit based on your budget is, is a good way to be thinking about how they diversify their grant funder. Like some of this is stuff that we ask questions about and we're trying to get information about it. But instead of us asking people to tell us that, we're telling people like, this is kind of what we expect from from your request um, and being transparent about that being something, you know, we don't want to fund 50% of your organization um, because that's not, that's not an efficient use of resources, but we also want you to be sustainable. We want it to be, we want to know that you can deliver it and that sort of thing. And so sort of this second one that bases it on their budget um, strikes me as a way to, um, be transparent about that instead of us trying to have to comb through and see like, is their ask actually reasonable compared to their overall budget? Um, are they actually, you know, being fiscally responsible? Um, we, we sort of put a little bit of parameters on, on that in some way. Um, the one thing on this, like for the second one, um, I feel like the under 250K, um, you know, 15,000 seems a little high for, to me in the sense of like, there are some smaller organizations that we've talked about that have had like innovative programs. And if they apply in that under 250K budget thing, you know, maybe we're not as stringent because we know that there's a, a much lower limit that they can ask for. You know, the organization that comes in and asks for $2,000, you know, is much different than the organization that comes in and asks for $150,000. Like our, the, the risk of like the city's money is much different for those two things. Um, you know, we sort of talked about like some of them being more innovative. And if you are like, hey, let's try a new program. We don't know how it's gonna go. Let's do something smaller. Then maybe that gives um, some of these smaller organizations some opportunities to try new things and, and use um, and, and fund some of those new programs. Uh, I see Karen and then Graham. Graham, why don't you go ahead? Graham, oh, you're muted still. Just wanna say I'm gonna miss you, Karen, retiring. <laughs> it's very sad. Um, how hard would it be, Eliberto, to model these two with actual data from like the last funding round? Is that like, is that going to ruin your, your weekend or is that a reasonable thing to apply these two schemes to our last year's funding and then just see what the practical sort of impact might be of the models um, and what the outliers would look like? I think, yeah, I, I can do it and I'll just stick to ceilings. I won't mess too much with floors. Um, if I stick with ceilings, it makes it a little bit easier and we'll see how much we would have actually fallen short um, with the money that we had. But yeah, I, I, I can do that. Um, yeah, because then I, I can just, you know, if we gave, if we gave on somebody 90%, then I'll just go with 90% of the ceiling. Yeah, it shouldn't be too hard. Okay, I, I personally like concept too, but it might help just understand the, the impact better if it's not too hard. Yeah, I can do that. Right. Welcome, Councilwoman Yarbrough. Good to see you. Your hair looks fantastic. So, oh. <laughs> Karen Roney. So I was, I was, this is not well thought out, but I just recalled uh, when we're talking about budget size, you, you know, we also have had conversations about that if you are an agency with a huge budget, then, you know, the, the conversation has been how much money from the city doesn't really matter, you know? So if, if someone's asked, if you're talking about a, an agency that has a $50 million budget, 
um, and they're asking for 25,000, which is, you know, a, a fraction of a percent of their overall agency budget, you know, we've also struggled with, with that, you know, is that a, does that really matter in the, in the scheme of things, um, you know, for serving, um, serving our community with such a, with where, if we're such a small amount of their total budget. I don't know what to do with that, but I remember we, we talk about that every year. Uh, Stacy. So, yeah, just, just a comment. Um, I can also very easily in my mind imagine these two models being combined, where if you're under $25,000 and you, you know, and you fall into the housing category or the resilience category, you know, then you have, you have all of, you have the social services underneath each of these programs. It's a little, it's more work and administration, but I, I can imagine that happening too, if it comes to that. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And I think, um, you know, I, when you said that, I was thinking about like, even, even if we didn't do like the same floor and ceiling for the, the categories, even saying like, we anticipate give it, you know, even if we just did a, a ceiling of like, we anticipate roughly X total dollars in housing stability, which means that, you know, sort of our limit, if you're asking for housing stability is going to be this or something, you know, so, some, some way of using that to give transparency again for like, I think Eliberto, you said like really communicating what our priorities are and trying to encourage um, more, more applications in some of those areas that we aren't getting it, but we know are huge priorities within the community. So, uh, Brian. Thank you, Caitlin. So I was in, in listening about to the goals, I, I wrote down three things. Uh, one is to increase efficiency. So Eliberto, you mentioned this, you know, administration cost ver relative to the award benefit. Uh, you know, there's some ratio there that needs to be met. And it makes sense to me that there are minimums that would help do that, whether they're set by budget size or, or just by program. Um, I do like program better than budget simply because if you've got a $250,000 organization, but they're delivering like amazing benefits uh, that we want, they're fulfilling needs that we need fulfilled, then to, to you know, under, uh, to fund them lower because their budget's smaller. I'm, you know, I'm not quite clear on that. But the other thing is to set expectations. So we talked about how do we set expectations? And it seems to me that's a matter of transparency. Any of these, if they go in front of the applicant, should help set expectations for how much they can get, how much they should apply for. Um, so I'm agnostic on that. And then the ensure that the needs are met, that idea of like, we, we just can't seem to get enough money out to these housing agencies. And maybe part of that is a function of expectations. Um, you know, that's possible. The, um, that's the one piece that I'm, I'm not quite seeing, like, you know, ideally in a, in a private industry, we'd go to whoever, whoever's kicking butt and say, hey, we wanna increase your production. You know, we're, we're willing to fund you to really ramp it up because you're doing the stuff that we need done. We can't do that in a public format. Um, so it seems to me maybe it's back to that kind of setting expectations component. Um, so I just wanted to throw those three out uh, because I think there's different parts of these that serve different elements of that kind of back to a combined scenario. Karen. Oh, we can't hear you. So I think, um, and, and some of this could, sorry, <laughs> it's our copier. Um, so I think some of this could uh, kind of segue maybe into the item number seven when we talk about the needs assessment. You know, I think for housing, one of the issue, one of the issues has to do with, um, we, for housing that really is around um, constructing, 
you know, and investing in new housing units and construction and rehab and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we have our other sources of funding that goes to support that. So that's our affordable housing fund. That's our CDBG, our home, our federal grant dollars. And, you know, that really goes for rehab and, and actual units. Um, you know, and so it, it could be that we want to rethink and maybe maybe it's when we talk about an, an, an update, if you will, to our needs assessment, you know, maybe we drill down a little more specifically in terms of, you know, how we can fund housing that really is linked to, to programs versus uh, capital investments. And so maybe if we did a little more work around that, um, we might get more of what we are able to fund with, um, with the human service agency dollars to support housing. Thanks for pointing that out to Karen of like how much of the funding is actually coming from different places than here. And we invest a lot in housing, but not in our pot. <laughs> so right. Not in this particular and, pocket, if you will. And I think last year we we started digging a little bit into that because we asked for a little bit more of like more of the budget that was being allocated to some of those various like community services and so forth. But mm -hmm. um, I kind of like where you're thinking of like contextualizing that like, you know, this is not, this is something that, you know, we get a lot of federal grant dollars and, you know, sort of these things for, but it's not necessarily something where, you know, individual agencies can actually really do as much around it um, in the same ways. So when Alberta goes to the next slide, it is really, what ideas do you have? You know, so these, we wanted to get the conversation going. Um, and we are not the keepers of all the ideas. So, um, so we would love to hear other ideas that you might have, um, you, you know, that we should, we should explore. Anyone have? Or not. Or <laughs> so, this isn't our last time we have the conversation, but um, again, we just wanted to get it going. Um, you know, maybe modeling some of these approaches with, you know, our 2022 applications would, you know, will help generate some other ideas. And it looks like we have another hand. Deanna. So I don't really have any other ideas. I just wanted to chime in that I think the increased transparency is great. And I really like that we're going in that direction. And I think um, from doing this the last few years, definitely I've seen some of the organizations have figured out to ask big. And I like um, that we're sort of moving towards, a, I think a little bit more equitable approach to paying out some of the cash just based on access to information by the organizations who some of them are definitely not asking for enough and some are asking for too much. Um, so I like the way that we're going with this. And I do think that modeling it would be really helpful to sort of see the practical application of these scenarios. So I appreciate that that may be a little work, but I think it's it would be really helpful to us. So, so, thank so, you. What, I, so what I have down that, that I wanna try that I'll bring to our next board meeting or and probably email it before, uh, once I get it done, is to model it with first individually, so using concept one and then using concept two, and then I'm going to try and figure out how I can combine them and see what it would look like. And again, I'm probably going to stick either to ceilings, not mess around too much with floors, um, and, and I'll use our same our same ranges that we use, so, so not to try and make it harder on myself. Um, I'll use same scores, same ranges, and just, but input these new ceilings and floor piece to it. Eliberto, one thing um, with that, when you do it, so like we could look at, if, even if you don't want to do the floors, one thing I think would be helpful to see is just like for housing stability, we got X number of requests, here was the minimum and the maximum that was requested for each of those like um, buckets that we did. Um, just to just so folks can see, like, 
okay, if we set a floor of $20,000, we, you know, this one, the lowest request we had anyway was $17,000. So like, that's not, that's my, that's not a whole lot different. So like, we don't necessarily need to see every individual one compared to the floor, but I'd like to, I'd love to just see like, what was sort of the minimum and the maximum that were asked in each of those categories? Uh, Brian. Uh, so one thing I think that we should not overlook because the so many of these were really kind of characterizing as communication mechanisms. Uh, some of them are mathematical based, many of them are mathematically based, but we're trying to communicate to organizations that do good work that they should be open about how much they ask for because the money's there. And we're trying to communicate to other organizations that um, you know, they're going to be limited in the amount they can ask for because there's some, uh, what, for whatever reason it is, right? So uh, we should just consider maybe narrative like an actual messaging kind of strategy, you know, get somebody from the city of Longmont marketing, uh, whatever department you all have there, but um, it's not unusual on, on new programs. And I think these, you know, this isn't new, but to think about what are the key messages we really want people to understand when they apply for these and have it maybe included as part of the application process or part of the solicitation process rather than a just kind of like a contracting mechanism. I I totally agree. And um, I will say, uh, you know, I don't know whether that's something the city can do. That's also, that's something I do in my job of like, hey, you know, this is, you know, you, you've got to tell the story. Um, so like doing better, at, you know, we have the needs assessment and we have provided some some categories, but even doing like, you know, sort of, from our from the board's perspective and from like this funding from the perspective of this funding what's the executive summary of like we know that housing is the most important thing and the city funds it in all of these ways like so here's kind of what we're looking for um, to help applicants like see like not just like hi the city is giving money for nonprofits and agencies but like what are the things that we're trying to help solve um, I think can go a long way toward that transparency and giving them a sense of like, why do we do this in the first place? I mean, I think a lot of them know, but like, what is it that, you know, we want them to take away from it? Councilwoman Yarbrough. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> Sounds so weird. Um, <laughs> I know I'm like Shakita, but. Uh, you know, yeah, just to keep it. You have been you have been duly elected by by the community, so you know yes. you you have earned that title. Yes, that is true. Um, you know, back to you know, I I think about Karen. Uh, um, I think about you too, Karen Roney, all the time. But right now, I'm talking about Karen Phillips. Um, I think about when Karen always say how are we communicating? How are they receiving the messages? And I think, Brian, you hit it, you know, you, you were right on it. And I think that what I'm trying to, what I'm, I know Karen and Ellie Burso don't know this yet, but I'm really working, I'm really going to work hard in our communication and marketing department to see how we can start making sure that um, we are communicating in a more effective way. And I think if we have something, when we have these applications out, if we just have a little bitty blurb of video, because think about the inequities of those organizations and we've seen them in those applications where they didn't fill it out properly and they're small organizations, right? They may not have an, a, a really good an accountant or they may not have the numbers or whatever. They may not know how to fill it out properly. So I think if we can have a little directional video um, on our website, on the city website, when they apply for that or something, when they can look and see what we exactly what we want, you know? Um, I don't know. I just feel like no matter what, in all areas, we really need to tighten up our communication. Um, it's very important for people to know exactly, not assume what we want, but know what we want and what we expect from them, because it's not fair for those people who may not 
um, have the resources that some of the other organizations and they're not able to, uh, you know, properly fill out those applications and everything and provide the information that we're looking for. So I do think that we need to work on our communication and I would love like a three minute video. Um, Caitlin, you can do that. You and Brian can do that video and um, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> but no, Karen, you always talk about that. How, are the, how do they get this information? How are the communities you know, receiving it. And, and that's, it's key from what I'm learning too, is that a lot of people really don't know that it's out there. It's the same people that know the same answers in our community, but how does everyone else know? And then when they find out about it, it's already done and over with, right? And so how can we get this information about the proper way of doing it um, and, and the expectations that this board has? I, I often think about like when, when you were talking, I was like, oh, I think about how like I want my kids to behave a certain way. And in order to get them to do what I want, I actually have to be really clear about like why, I, why I'm asking them to do it. And then also what I expect. And I'm not like, I'm not trying to say that like agencies are kids, but like when we are not transparent or we like kind of hide the ball of like what we're doing, um, we're not setting them up for success. Um, and I think that like, without fail, like every single person on this board, like, you know, I, I think about Karen Phillips talking about like, what are we doing to empower them to be successful? Um, how, you know, giving them money is one piece of it, but we know that like Karen and Eliberto and other folks in the city are doing more than that. Like, so let's, let's highlight those ways um, that we do it. Um, you know, so if there's a new agency that doesn't know they can call up Eliberto and ask for more details, like, let's make sure they know, like, some of that nitty gritty of like, not just like, hey, if you have questions, call Eliberto, but like, hey, you know, if you need help with, you know, understanding X, Y, Z, these are, that's the type of questions we can answer. Um, you know, we're not going to fill out the grant application for you, but we can give you direction type of thing. Because um, you guys, Eliberto, you and everyone else, like you all do great things. And I think there, there are probably people who could use that expertise that don't utilize it. Other ideas that folks might have, I, we, we've gone a little bit sideways, but I think it's good, good stuff. Um, other ideas folks have um, around the communication um, and sort of setting, you know, limits or trying to get more out of the application process that would help us. Okay. I think we have some next steps that Eliberto is gonna work on. And, you know, this is, this was an opening conversation, not the, the decision-making conversation. So um, I encourage folks to, to think about it and, you know, if, think if there are other, you know, creative ways that we could think about this or um, that would make life easier as we review applications um, so that we can continue the discussion. Okay. Anything else you need for that, Eliberto? Okay, um, the next item is the 2020 Human Services Needs Assessment, reviewing that and the possibility of an update. Karen, is this one you or is it Eliberto again? He's gonna be on his own here, you know? So <laughs> you're like, here, wings, fly, there's a mountain, go fly off of it. <laughs> no, well, I think, I'll, I'll introduce it. What what the heck? So um, so you have in your your packet the 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 big the big honking document, right? So that was the <laughs> so so that was the assessment that we conducted back in um, 2019 and, and 2020. We completed it um, right at the um, height of the and well when we closed things down. So. Um, and so 
just some some grounding is that um, when we completed this, the timing for completing this human services needs assessment, which indeed informs our priority for funding, uh, we lined that up so that um, we would be conducting the human service assessment along with the housing and community development needs assessment as part of the um, consolidated plan process, which is a requirement of the city for us to continue to receive federal dollars as an entitlement, primarily for our community development block grant dollars. So, so in 2020, we lined up and we have, we, we um, used the same vendor as we use for conducting our consolidated plan and our housing assessment. And so now we're on the five-year cycle. So I, I think our, our our, our question to the, um, you know, to the board is, questions is, is twofold. And is that one, is that, do you think that there is value in conducting some kind of a mid midterm assessment, if you will, sometime during that five, uh, that five year period? Um, and so, which, which is, you know, we're thinking if we're gonna do that, um, that, as we go into the 2023 budget process for the, the city, um, it might be funding that we ask for to, um, if, if we need that, to do some, um, you know, to do a, a kind of a midterm assessment. And, you know, we also were, were thinking and we, and we would like to get um, input from the board is what would be the scope of that midterm assessment, if you will. So, you know, one of the things that, and I mentioned that when we were talking about the, the housing stability area is, you know, do, do we take that opportunity to really dig down more deeply in, ter in some of these needs that are identified in the needs assessment and really understand a little bit more about the nature of those needs and how our funding could really go to support um, some, some specific needs in the community in, in some of those areas. So, you know, we, we started to do that or we tried to do that um, in, you know, early 2020 with doing some focus groups. And again, that was right when things were starting to shut down with, with COVID. So, um, and, you know, I don't know how much, we didn't get, get the greatest participation, but, but you know, we're just thinking is that there might be some, um, it's not a full on needs assessment, um, but that we would do some kind of uh, process that would really help us dive more deeply into um, the nature of some of the needs to better flesh out what we might wanna do with them and what those gaps are. Alberto, what would you like to add to that? I think the one thing I would add is I actually ran this uh, by our community, our partners of Boulder County and City of Boulder, and, and that would be their preference too. what Karen just said is uh, partly and their reasoning behind it is throughout the throughout the pandemic, uh, we've done and, and they've done in particular, I know, I know Boulder County has done, you know, multiple assessments. Um, as they're getting ready for their ARPA and their, their COVID funding, they've done a lot of this work. And so there is a little bit of concern of, of uh, just oversaturation of, of surveying people, you know, survey fatigue type of situation. And to Karen's point, they think it would be good to dive a little deeper into some of our needs, or make, you know, not do everything, but choose a few that we think are are need some more some more uh, research and 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 thought. So that that would be that I did run it by our our our, our partners at, at the county and the city of Boulder, and that was their their suggestions as well. Karen Phillips. Yeah, I, I can't help. I just this can't help but say, you know, that's that whole thing, it was huge, reading through it, um, you know, the needs, it was like, yeah, 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 but I just didn't see any solution. I mean, 
it just went on and on about what we need and la 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 and it's just like well so at the end then you list the agencies that might help but I just as I was reading it going well where's the solution where's the solution I mean it's great to know that we all kind of know what the needs are but it doesn't seem like we're addressing any solutions so I don't know how that can be incorporated into it but that's when I was reading it I'm like okay so what do we do about that then you know what do we do that's how I felt when I read that whole thing Brian you almost said that with fatigue in your voice Caitlin no you. not at all <laughs> uh, so I, I think along what Karen Phillips was saying, one of the things that I was just thinking about as you were talking about this is it, uh, rather than like doing a survey of the community and what do you need, I wonder if it would be helpful to have a, a better idea of best practices around, you know, all of this is an ecosystem, right? We know that uh, if you pay less for housing, you have more to pay for medical bills. But if you get sunk in medical bills, it's really hard to, you know, all of these things kind of interrelated. And whether there are any best practices, like if housing is the target, are there, is it just about getting houses? Is that the right way to approach it? Or is there a body of knowledge that says, well, if you can, if you can really push on the medical end of it, uh, you'll find that you have a dramatic impact on people staying in their houses, you know, something like that. I'm making it up, right? But um, almost like a, a survey of research out there for solutions. There's two schools of thought on that, Brian. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> there, there are certainly cities and places that do like housing first policies where like getting people into stable housing is first and foremost the thing that like helps the, the you know, sort of cascades. And then there are other, uh, I mean, there are certainly experts on this, but my sense from that one is that like, there's sort of a, a strong divide <laughs> um, of like folks that are very much like housing first. And then folks that are like, you need to do all of the, the things to make sure someone can stay in housing and not just get into it in the first place. I, I don't disagree. Like, I think, understand I, what I hear, Karen and Brian and other folks can chime in. What I hear is that, you know, we know there's this need, but like, how does that manifest specifically in our community? So like, do we need, you know, specific types of services? So like, I think we talked about like the needs assessment talking about specifically about car repair. And that was like a very weird, like, thing to be specific about when a lot more of it was like very broad and vague <laughs> um, and not clear on like, okay, housing, but like, you know, we want people to come up with innovative things, but we also would like to know, like, does that mean we need more rentals? Do we need more things that are more affordable? Like, how do we actually break that down into something that like is more than just like housing is unaffordable? Like it, it, that feels a little bit like, sure, we all know that in Boulder County, um, you know, we hear people talking about that a lot, but what is like, how do we actually address that? Other comments or questions or thoughts on like a mid, mid cycle needs assessment, Graham. I'd rather just spend the money on on supporting the nonprofits in, in other concrete ways rather than surveying them. So I at this point would vote against a med survey. Uh, Deanna. Well, I know we you just talked about other organizations or county programs have done surveys. Can't we just sort of crib their work? I mean, I don't know why we need to reinvent the wheel, right? So if they've already done some of these updated surveys through the pandemic, and one of the things we're worried about is fatigue on surveying, can't we just use their survey? I don't know why we need to do it twice, right? Right, right. And again, what they, what the county doesn't want to do more surveys, what they, what they are suggesting is could we dig a little deeper into certain areas of need that we know to, to, to learn you know, what exactly are the needs or, or what's like to Caitlin's point, more specifics 
Or maybe to Karen's point is in digging deeper, can we can we can we find research uh, solutions? I mean, I, I don't know what that deep deeper dive looks like, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Um, that's just when I brought up the subject, that's what they that's what they they talked about. They 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 had no appetite to do more surveys. Brian. To Bram's question or point, is it all is it coming out of the same bucket of money? The the survey cost would have come out of these funds. I don't think we have any money. <laughs> Karen. I wasn't. I wasn't envisioning that it would come out of our human service agency bucket, that it would be um, a, a proposal that we would submit in terms of the, like the community services budget, that we might make a, a one-time request for X. So that's what we did when we funded the, the needs assessment that we, um, that we conducted in, in 2020. So it was, I don't know, I don't remember the number, 25,000, something like that, that, you know, that we would ask it wouldn't come out of the human service agency bucket. Karen Phillips and then Shakita. Yeah, I, I just think that um, we, we're really well aware of the needs. It's just, yeah, that, that we already know that. It's yeah. just, it's all the other stuff. And I don't know how we can look for solutions, but it's just, you know, after that lengthy thing going over and over the needs, it's like, yeah, we get it, we get it, you know? So I don't know, that's what I got to say about it. Shakita. So I, I have a question. Um, do we have, do we have like, um, I know organizations probably have their own surveys according to whatever programs, because I know YWCA, if there's a program we have, uh, surveys particular programs so can we get data from those I know there may be some some um, privacy laws or inform I don't know but is there any way we can get like some data within the organization um, if they take surveys within the organization rather than the city paying for this huge big you know uh, survey um, because we can use the information that they're already collecting, you know? I don't know, maybe I'm like talking over my head and I don't know, so. You, you, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think in, in, um, in the past, mostly we have utilized um, data from other sources. So I think, I think to your point, if I'm understanding it, is that, um, and, and it, it just was the last couple of times that we actually did primary data collection through our own assessment. But prior to that, we absolutely used the data that was already out there and, um, and, and use that for our, for our assessment. So, um, so I think we certainly could do that. And I'm not envisioning just, I, I am not envisioning that we would, we would ask for a lot of money you know, to do more primary data collection. I think to Karen's point, got it. We know the needs, what the heck should we be doing about it? And so, um, you know, so, so if we wanted to do some best practice research, if we wanted to, you know, run some, I don't know, some focus groups or whatever to just drill down a little bit more is really what I would think we would do. We wouldn't want to be asking for a, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, of, of money. I don't know, um, and and we would just have to look at the capacity of being able to for Ellie Berto to do that too. <laughs> so in addition to everything else, so you know, but it, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a big budget ask, I don't think, in terms of because uh, we wouldn't be doing primary data collection. I do like focus groups. I do like that. So, so I guess what I'm hearing is um, that don't spend a lot of money, don't take it out of the direct funding bucket, if you will, really don't spend a, a whole lot of money, look at how we can learn more about what do we do about the needs, 
um, you know, what is it that we are, that we should be doing that we haven't even considered? And if we can throw some best practice research in there and um, so that, that we just have a better idea of what kind of investments make the most sense um, from our dollars to help really address some of these needs that we're seeing. Yep. Plus one. Okay. All right. Um, the last item on our agenda is other business indoor announcements. Do we have any? Brian and then Karen. I'm the ant going up tonight. In uh, so this is a perhaps a policy question. Um, the chat function on these meetings can be really valuable for somebody like me who doesn't necessarily want to always talk, but would love to just write something in the chat. Um, and they can be saved. So do we not have a chat function as a matter of like city policy or... Um, I mean, am I the only one who's like, God, I wish I could just write a sentence in the chat and, you know, or give a, a thumbs up or the party hat to what you just said, because that was so awesome. I assumed it was policy and accessibility for when these meetings are posted um, to make sure that there's all the information is there, but I actually have no idea. Um, I'm very used to having like, chat and other things. Um, funny you should say the like emoji responses because um, I got these, uh, before Zoom actually had all the various responses, I got these coasters that were sent out for a remote conference that I went to that have like various like responses on them and and people like, I have like eight of them and people would hold them up before you could actually do it digitally. So, I mean, that's a good, it, it, that's a good question. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the otter yay. <laughs> I think it's because we're co recording and I, I, I think, but I don't know. Maybe. I, look, I, look, I look see council member, uh, your honor will use the otter yay during city council. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm totally so, going to make you a set, Shakita, and send them over to you to use during council meetings. <laughs> hey, hey, Erica, do you, wanna, do you want to hop on? Yes. So do you, do you know, um, do you know the answer to this? I mean, I know in, in terms of why we don't have a chat function on Zoom is because if you buy a different level of Zoom account, because I mean, we just, we're using the, the Zoom account it's our Sam account, I think. And we we just went with the basic pricing of Zoom. Do you know if you- So I believe that we do have the function to have the chat. We just have it, um, or Susan had it disabled so that um, it doesn't interfere with the recordings. Um, and I know that once you download the recording, it doesn't download whatever was submitted on the chat, which is why she disabled it. Um, however, I do know, other meetings, I don't know if board meetings use the chat function, but then print out the chat. Um, I don't know how it gets posted, however. But I, can definitely, I can definitely make a research. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we can just learn more about, yeah. So I didn't know whether, because we were cheap and we just bought the basic level of uh, the Zoom uh, subscription or, or yeah, or was it a control issue? I'm going to get one of those elementary school chalkboard tablets. <laughs> yep, there you go. Comments <laughs> and just hold them up. Yep, that's right. Because we, you know, we use the chat function on Teams. We use it on WebEx. Um, but yeah. And it is helpful. So Erica will do some research. And, and to see, you know, well, anyhow, yes, we will. Thank you. We will check it out. Awesome. Um, Karen? So 
this is really just a, a, an FYI. So I believe next Tuesday, Shakita and her colleagues on city council will be uh, talking about a possible pre-interview process for uh, board and commission um, applicant selection. So I just wanted to give you a, a heads up. Obviously we will take direction from council member uh, Yarbrough and her colleagues uh, in terms of which, which path we're gonna go down. But I think there, the council did provide some direction to our city clerk staff to, um, to, to look at more involvement from existing advisory board members to kind of do an initial vetting, if you will, and initial interviewing of applicants for, um, so that would apply in the future for housing and human services uh, board slots um, and to make some recommendations to uh, city council about who, who you think they should appoint to the, the, um, the board based on, you know, your, your, your interview. So, so I just wanted to give you that heads up. Um, the, the city clerk staff met with some of the board liaisons and, and there is information going in the, the council packet for the 15th of February, if you wanna uh, check that out. Um, I don't think the, counts, the packet is posted yet, but it should be by tomorrow if you wanna look at what is, what is in there. And we will be coming back for... Um... <laughs> That's a great chat. <laughs> well done, Brian. <laughs> so we'll bring an update <laughs> Uh, back at your March meeting about the direction that we received from city council. So just, just a, you know, just a heads up about that. Thanks, Karen. And that's the only announcement I had. All right. Any other announcements from folks or other business? In which case I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Karen Phillips. Make a motion yeah. to adjourn meeting. And Deanna seconded. See you all next month. Thank you. Everybody good to see you. Bye. Have a good month.